The topic uh, of today is are we heading for a new renaissance? Some reflections about the current renewal of classical studies. So, uh, in the last, I would say, in the last 20 years, we all have seen some new realities. Um, it all started 10 years before uh, with the Aestiva Romae Latinitas, uh, Reginald Foster, in Rome in 1985. Reginald Foster has been, especially in the States, uh, the one person who has uh, uh, trained many American scholars in living Latin. And uh, uh, 10 years later, we have all a series of uh, institutions that have been founded. The Academia Vivarium Novum in Rome in 1996, at the same time the Conventiculum Latinum Lexingtoniense in Lexington, so Terence Stanberg, uh, 1996 as well. Then we have Salvi, uh, Nancy Elewin, uh, Los Angeles, 1997. Uh, I would mention also the Cuclos Hellenicos in Paris, so a circle of uh, living Greek. Uh, they meet uh, every, I think, twice a month. Uh, we have, of course, the Paideia Institute in New York, 2010. And uh, the Policy Institute is the very last one. Uh, it started officially only in 2011. This is only to mention some of them. There are many other institutions like that. So the question, the main question that we, we can ask ourselves is, does this amount to a new cultural movement? And if it does, can we further describe it? Can we compare it to former similar movements? So we all experience this renewal of spoken Latin and to a lesser extent of uh, spoken Greek. Is this a new cultural movement? How can we define it? There have been many Renaissance movements throughout history. We can call it retour aux sources in French, uh, new access to sources. And I think that in each one of these Renaissance movements that have happened throughout history, we have four common elements that uh, are uh, always met. First of, first of all, we have either a continuity or a breakaway from the immediate past. Secondly, a link with a major technological innovation. Thirdly, a renewal of ancient languages knowledge. And last but not the least, a new conception of what a classic author is. The first Renaissance defined like this as a retour aux sources, as a new access to ancient sources, can be uh, identified in the 3rd, 2nd century BC. In this case, there is a full continuity with the text of Homer and all the text, uh, the Attic texts, uh, that were uh, written in the century of Pericles. We uh, see in that moment a major technological innovation. For the first time, we have a state library, the Library of Alexandria, which is a major event. Uh, in that library, there is a tremendous activity of text edition. That is also a new, um, a new technological uh, event. Um, it is, it's at the Library of Alexandria that science of edition was born. From the point of view of the renewal of the knowledge of uh, ancient languages, we see in Alexandria the first Greek glossaries. So at the beginning, the first glossaries were just tools in order that people could read the text of Homer. There were many difficult words in the text of Homer, so uh, the scholars of Alexandria were compo composing uh, some lexica in order to help people to read the text of Homer. It's also at that moment that we have the first grammars. Grammar is a Greek thing. Grammar is a Greek invention. And 
we have also, uh, for the first time in the Greek world, but I mean, uh, there were other commentaries, uh, for instance, in, in, in the Sumero-Akkadian world. We have, for the first time in the Greek world, the first commentaries. From the point of view of the concept of what a uh, classic author is, uh, it's at Alexandria that we find, for the first time, the first literary canon for Greek poets. Aristophanes of Byzantium is going to give a list of the encrithentes, that is, the authors that are chosen because of their outstanding uh, capacity of uh, writing and for the quality of their language. The second Renaissance, the second uh, retour aux sources, uh, seems to have happened in the second century AD. In this case, there is also continuity with the immediate past, and there is a major technological innovation. The codex that was, uh, I mean, as far as we know, well, you know the difference between volumen and codex. The codex is what, what, what we know as a book as a material book today. Mm? Uh, so the codex started, I mean, the first uh, evidence that we have of codex started already in the first century, but it's in the second century that the usage of codex has to become overspread. And this is uh, tremendously important because the codex has generally many large margins. So in the margins, you can write a commentary, you can write a scholion, you can write uh, um, uh, your notes. So there is the text and the commentary, the text and uh, the reflection of the author, of, of the scholar who is reading that text. Um, from the point of view of the development of uh, Greek and Latin language and the knowledge of Greek and Latin language, we can say that and in that period we see the development of rhetorics and sophistics. Uh, uh, in Athens there is the Hadrian's uh, Library Foundation. Um, very soon there will be uh, chairs of rhetorics and a chair of philosophy. And uh, what is very significant, we have a list of autores classici. So the concept of classic was already born with, uh, at Alexandria with the encrithentes. And here we have the very word classicus that appears uh, precisely in, in that period. In fact, <coughs> if, we, if today we have only seven plays by Aeschylus and seven by Sophocles, it is because that was the choice that was made precisely in that period. So there was a decision to let children learn uh, at school those plays and no other plays. And that, that selection uh, decided about the fate of all the plays of uh, these two authors that we had uh, till then. So if we have only these 14 plays, it was because there was a choice. And that choice was a choice that was made by scholars uh, in order to facilitate uh, study uh, in the different uh, schools of the second century AD. We then have a third renaissance from the 8th to the 10th century AD. Uh, this is the Carolingian renaissance in the west and the Macedonian renaissance in the east. There are both of, uh, the two of them are um, linked. It's a, a single renaissance, we could say. Um, in this case also there is a big continuity with the immediate past. There is a, a very important uh, technological innovation, and that innovation is the Carolingian minuscule. So, in a codex, in a manuscript, immediately you have a capital letter and the minuscule. So you know where the sentence is starting. It could seem something obvious, but it wasn't. Before, you couldn't guess at first sight, where was the beginning of the sentence. All the letters were written, uh, all the words were written without spaces, so it was very, very difficult to, uh, it was impossible to read uh, without reading out loud. You know that once uh, 
uh, we have this anecdote of uh, St. Augustine. He entered a library where he found St. Ambrosius. And he was astonished to see that St. Ambrosius was reading uh, silently. And he said that St. Ambrosius was the only person he had ever met that was able to do that. So anyone who would read would read out loud. Because you had first, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, like uh, see the picture of the word and iconize the word. It was impossible because words weren't separated. Uh, so uh, people have to read, had to read out loud. Um, well, with the Carolingian minuscule, the situation hasn't changed dramatically, but at least it was easy to see where the sentence would start. And it's the period when many ancient uncial manuscripts are transliterated. So from capital letters to minuscules. From the point of view of uh, the um, renewal of uh, ancient languages, at least for Latin, we have the rediscovery of Latin grammars. And uh, the first book that start, start to be copied are precisely Latin grammars. And from the point of view of uh, the reorganization of the paideia or the studies or the, 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 the list of authors, of ancient authors to be studied, we, have, we can say that it is the period when we have the establishment in study centers of the trivium and the quadrivium. So we have a, a full reorganization of studies that happens precisely during the Carolingian Renaissance. Then we have the full Renaissance, which is the Renaissance par excellence, uh, 12th, 14th century AD. So, sorry, sorry, not the, uh, not the Renaissance par excellence, sorry, sorry, I'm going too fast. We have the full Renaissance, which is in the middle of the Middle Ages, 12th, 14th century AD. So in the West, it starts in the 12th century, and in the East, uh, in the 13th, 14th century. But the two Renaissance are uh, intertwined. There is a profound continuity, continuity with former, uh, former uh, texts. It's the period when uh, um, Aristotle is rediscovered. Some books of Aristotle are rediscovered in the West. So from the point of view of uh, the technology, we have a major technological innovation. For the first time, in the continent, in uh, continental Europe, we start having word separation in manuscripts. This happened already before in Ireland and England, but only there. And uh, it, we have to wait till the 12th century to see word separation in manuscripts. And suddenly, we have some testimonies of monks who are praying their breviary in silence. Because as soon as uh, there is a separation of words, immediately there is the possibility of uh, iconizing the words that uh, uh, people are seeing when they read. Another innovation is that you have massive copying of manuscripts. This is not yet uh, the print, but uh, instead of copying a manuscript at one time, you take the quaternia and you have uh, some workshops where you have plenty of monks who are copying different quaternia, and then uh, 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 a book in a short time uh, could be copied in, uh, we could get 50 copies of a single manuscript in a relatively short time. So this is a major technological innovation. From the point of view of the knowledge of ancient languages, we can see, say that in the Byzantine world there is the development of philology with some uh, outstanding scholars like Maximus Planudes, Manuel Moschopopoulos, Thomas Magister, Demetrius Triclinus. And from the point of view of uh, the canon of the texts that are to be read, we can say that it is the moment where we have new Latin translations of philosophical and scientific texts, either from Arabic or from Greek. So, for instance, the Logica Novus of Aristotle, of Aristotle or, for instance, the metaphysics of Aristotle. Uh, for the first time, we have Latin translations that reach Europe precisely in that period. So then we have the fifth Renaissance, which is the Renaissance par excellence. 15th, 16th century, the Renaissance of Italy. Here, instead of continuity, we have a breakaway. 
from the immediate past. So, in fact, there is a will. I am talking about tendencies. There are many exceptions to what I am saying. Those are not uh, strict rules. But you have a breakaway uh, from the immediate past, and there is a will to come back to classic Latin or classical Greek. Um, from the point of view of, uh, and, in, and to get rid of all the commentaries and the tradition of commenting those texts, to get directly to the original. From the point of view of technological innovation, we have a major, a very important technological innovation, which is the development of print with Gutenberg. Uh, so this has major consequences, because instead of having a manuscript, I have a printed text. So the text is fixed. There are no variant readings in principle with a print, printed text. Everybody uh, who will get a copy of that text will have the same text. Then, if I want to uh, make an annotation on the mar in the margin, immediately I will see that this is not the text. Because my, man my annotation will be manuscript, whereas the text is printed. This didn't happen with the manuscripts. With the manuscripts, you wouldn't tell the difference uh, immediately. Well, because it is in the margin, but it would be very easy for another copyist to uh, include what was in the margin in, in, into the text, as has happened uh, time and again. From the point of view of the renewal of ancient languages, we can say that it is a period of spoken Latin, uh, as the former periods. And I wouldn't dare say that it was a period of spoken Greek, but at least of a very intensive study of Greek. Uh, for some people, it could be also a spoken Greek, but uh, let, us, let us say study of Greek. And then, uh, from the point of view of the canon of the authors to be read, we have uh, the choice of pagan antiquity, mainly. So, uh, uh, and we still are under that influence. Uh, living under that influence. So someone who goes to classical studies has, will get the idea that the important authors in Greek are the authors of the 5th century BC and in Latin from the 1st century BC. So the question is, are we in a 6th Renaissance? Of course, we, the first thing that we can say is that we cannot compare what is happening now to what was happening in the five previous renaissances, at least for one reason. And in the five previous renaissances, uh, these cultural movements affected all the intelligentsia of that time, whereas what is happening now is affecting uh, a very tiny proportion, a very small proportion of uh, the scholars of nowadays. So uh, we are not going to compare it from that point of view. Um, but what about uh, the other uh, elements that we were just identifying in the former Renaissance? Um, it's very difficult to describe what is happening. Why? Because um, we don't have any perspective. We are immersed in what is happening and it does, has started to happen only 20 years ago. So the first question is, are we in a breakaway from the immediate past or in a continuity? It's difficult to say uh, because uh, somehow we experience uh, a kind of breakaway because we are doing it in a different way. We are reading texts that other people are not reading. And at the same time, we are in a continuity with uh, the, former, the, the five former Renaissance. From the point of view of uh, technology, there is, that's very clear. We are the children of the digital revolution. And in all what we are doing, uh, everything becomes digital. Okay, so you have people Skyping in Greek and Latin. You have uh, blogs in Greek and Latin, or a mixture of uh, Latin and English, or something like that. You have uh, all kind of uh, uh, digital resources and development of digital resources. Some uh, very strange books that were written in the 16th, 17th century, um, Orbis, Pictus, and so on, are just uh, found uh, uh, in a digital version and uh, sent uh, everywhere. 
I mean, we really have, a, we are living in a digital revolution. From the point of view of the uh, knowledge of ancient languages, we can say that really there is a coming back to spoken Latin. Well, in fact, the tradition was never fully interrupted for Latin because there have always been Latin speakers. I think that for Greek, there has been an interruption of the tradition. Uh, Byzantine scholars could, uh, would uh, speak a kind of Koine Greek, but uh, ever since this uh, hasn't happened and the Catharaeus, our uh, formal, uh, formal form of uh, modern Greek, is very different than Koine or classical Greek. In any case, we are experiencing many new teaching methods. And the question is about the canon. I have really the impression that we are heading uh, for a larger canon. We are taking into consideration Koine Greek. We are taking into consideration even Byzantine Greek. We are taking in consi into consideration Imperial Latin, Erasmus, Neo-Latin. We have heard some uh, uh, lectures about uh, all these uh, works that have been written in Latin in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. Some words about the Polis Institute, which is only one institute among uh, many, many others. And uh, my list was uh, uh, very, uh, very short and uh, very partial because I couldn't list all the institutions that uh, exist today. But I, I will talk a little bit about the Polis Institute within that uh, movement. So. Uh, from the point of view, I mean, it's easier for me to describe what is happening in the Polis Institute than to describe what is happening in other institutes. I would say that uh, there is rather continuity and renewal. So we try to adapt antiquity to nowadays reality. Uh, so uh, the texts that we are uh, proposing to our students many times are texts that are outside the canons. Uh, but uh, it includes the canon, but, uh, but the canon is not only the canon of classical authors, but it is not the only the only uh, material that we are, we are uh, proposing. Especially because if we want to have, to, to find texts that are easy to read, either we search among the texts of the Hellenistic period, or we won't be able to find easy texts. For instance, um, I am using with my students uh, the life of Aesop, which is an easy text uh, in Greek. This is not a canonical text. It is, very, it is not even in Lub. In the, in the Harvard collection, but it is easy to read. So uh, if you want to find easy text to read, you have to search uh, other, other texts. Then from the point of view of uh, the new methods for uh, learning ancient languages, we have the Polis method. That is, it, this is not only Greek. So far, you, you have seen the, the Greek book. It has disappeared. I wanted to to just uh, to give it to someone here, but it has disappeared uh, this afternoon. So uh, if it has disappeared, it's a good sign. <laughs> anyway, so there's the first uh, uh, volume has been published. The second volume is about to be published because it's uh, almost finished. And the third one is a work in progress. So when the three volumes will cover the whole morphology. Then we have the Latin method, forum. Forum, uh, I hope that uh, for next fall, you will be able to buy the forum text. This, is, this will be the first volume of the Latin, met, the Latin method. It's really, uh, if we compare it with Orberg, so Orberg was an outstanding uh, uh, achievement, uh, but now we need something else. We need not only to read, but to speak Latin. And so forum is precisely a method that uh, uh, aims at teaching how to speak Latin. And then we are uh, preparing all the methods for Biblical Hebrew, always spoken Biblical Hebrew, uh, spoken Arabic, uh, and even spoken Sumerian. Uh, I was very proud this uh, last uh, fall because um, Wayne Horowitz, uh, a standing scholar, a professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem who has taught Sumerian for 25 years, he came to us and he said, I want to start for the first time to teach Sumerian in Sumerian. If you thought that Latin was a dead language or Greek, <laughs> you know, when people stopped speaking Sumerian in 1200 BC, 
more dead than Sumerian, impossible. So he was, for the first time, speaking Sumerian in class. And that was fantastic. So uh, we hope within 10, 15 years to get from that also a method of living Sumerian. So uh, from the point of view of uh, the canon, as, uh, um, uh, I as I was saying, there is uh, an interest in Polis, in the Polis Institute, not only in classical languages, but also in Semitic languages. Jerusalem is a kind of connection between West and East. And so uh, you don't have any other city where half of the city speaks Arabic and some Armenian. And uh, there are some families who speak uh, even uh, um, Aramaic at home. Uh, and then the other half speaks Hebrew, and there is a quarter where you, they speak Am Am Amharic, Ethiopian. Um, well, it's quite impressive. So it's a, a meeting point of East and West. So if we want to study the history of the translations from Greek to Syriac, from Syriac to Arabic, or from Syriac to Hebrew, Jerusalem is the place where we can do it. And uh, this is why we are developing two master programs. One in ancient philology, which comprises Greek, Biblical Hebrew, and Latin. And another one in uh, Near Eastern studies, uh, which comprises Arabic, Hebrew, uh, Syriac, and uh, as an option, Sumerian. So we also are interested in the continuity between antiquity and the Middle Ages. Um, there is something I wanted to say because uh, um, it might be perhaps interesting that you tell around you about that. We are proposing six grants for next year for either uh, of the two master programs. So uh, uh, those grants are different in, uh, in nature. There are some who cover the whole, uh, the whole uh, tuition fees and there are others who cover only part of the tuition fees. But uh, it's interesting that if you know about people who might be interested in studying either the full master or a one-year program, because we have also that formula for one year in Jerusalem, uh, uh, you can enter into the website and ask uh, and look at the possibilities for the grants. Um, that's it. I think that we have, uh, I don't know if we have some time for questions. There is no time. It's a little bit late. We have to, to stop. Thank you.